Okay, good. So, uh, welcome to the second talk. So, uh, I will begin by uh, a review from last time. So, recall from last time that uh, when we consider the splitting field K of this polynomial, x cubed minus 2 over the rational numbers, we'll have, uh, so we'll need to adjoin all three roots to the rational numbers to get the splitting field. It's going to be Q root of 2, Q root of 2 uh, times the third root of unity, and Q root of 2 times the Q root of unity squared. So uh, these are the three roots of this polynomial. And we said, then we had, then we claimed the non trivial fact that we didn't prove that we had six permutations that preserve all the uh, rational relations satisfied by the three roots. For example, this relation here, x2 plus x3 cubed plus 2 equals 0, this relation is actually satisfied by the, uh, by the three roots. Because when you plug in the second root, this one, and the third root, which is that one, and you, and you add them together, you get this point here on the complex plane. And uh, it's going to be minus 2. And uh, when you add 2, you do get 0. And this polynomial has only rational coefficients. What's amazing is that uh, all six permutations of the variable order will, will preserve the truth of this uh, relation. For example, even if I swap uh, x1 with x2, which doesn't even appear in this uh, equation here, it still remains true. So when I do this swap, I get x1 plus x3 cubed plus 2 equals 0. And pictorially, the reason this is still true of the three roots is because regardless which pair, regardless which pair of the three roots you add, you still get an equilateral triangle that is always going to cube into minus 2. For example, when I add the first root to the third root, I'll have this root plus that root will give me this root here. It's going to be a perfect hexagon, so I'm going to use that to my advantage when I draw this. Uh, okay, that's really <laughs> bad, but okay. So let's try again. Ugh. Okay. No. It's too short. That's it. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> so you're going to get this point here, and that's going to be 60 degrees. Okay. So this is a1 plus a2 this point here. And when you cube this complex number, when you cube it, you will also get minus 2. 60 degrees, 120 degrees, 180 degrees. You still end up here at minus 2. So this is still true. And regardless which pair you add, same thing here. This will end up being 60 degrees here. And when you cube uh, a2 plus a1, uh, you still get back to minus 2. So regardless which two numbers you add, you always end at minus 2. And uh, you always end up at minus 2 after you cube it. Uh, in particular, it, when you add x2 and x3, when you add a2 and a3, uh, it already ends up already at minus 2. So when you cube it, it's still minus 2. So uh, this seems miraculous, right? Um, even asymmetric relations uh, remain true when you permute them. So it's a, a bit of a magic there. So, uh, so these six permutations uh, are what we mean by the structure within the roots. So there is intrinsic structure within the roots of this polynomial that uh, uh, is, present, is uh, expressed by the existence of these six permutations. On the other hand, we had some interesting observations that uh, the field itself, the splitting field itself, also has intrinsic uh, structure. And Galois theory merely says, so this is the classic Galois theory, theory statement. The statement says, uh, um, rather that the, the discipline of the classical Galois theory studies the relationship between uh, the structure of the roots in terms of relation preserving Uh, uh, permutations and trying to find the relation between this structure and the structure of the splitting field. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, and uh, so in the in the modern view, instead of viewing the permutations, uh, there's a natural sort of correspondence between such permutations and automorphisms of the splitting field that fix the coefficient field, the ground field. So uh, let's make that precise. Let uh, k be a field. Uh, and, well, okay, let us do this more efficiently. Let f and k be fields. Uh, define the automorphisms on k to be the set of all maps. Okay. Uh, a map f from k to k is an automorphism. So this is just written down for the record. I'm sure all of you know what this is already. Uh, if f is a bijection. So a field isomorphism is one that preserves all. Wait. So. So <laughs> let me uh, just say if f is a, an isomorphism. The point is the, uh, the the domain and the codomain are the same. That's why we call it. A, okay. The point of this definition is so that we record why this prefix changed. So an isomorphism is a structure preserving map that's also a bijection. So in particular, uh, FA, FB is FAB. Okay. And furthermore, FA plus FB is, oh, now I read it the other way. Okay, <laughs> sure. Uh, and one over FA equals FA inverse. So I would do this. And negative F of A is F of negative A. I think this one is the odd one up. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, so that's just for the record. And uh, ought, define ought k to simply be the set of all automorphisms. And uh, so we will mostly be concerned with the object gkf which is this, a subset of the automorphisms where uh, for all x in f, f of x equals x. So it fixes the field f. So I claim that there's a natural bijection, well, natural, uh, between this object and this object. So let me make that precise. So uh, let so proposition. It's not numbered. It's actually we're still uh, being informal at this point. Uh, the proposition is let f be in GKF. Then f of uh, then uh, so let k actually let's just write everything out properly. Let uh, f a be fields where uh, k is the splitting field uh, in fact let's do it over q because we're still being intuitive uh, of a polynomial f Then one f permutes the roots of f. Oh. What? Let f be in G of course. Um. Uh, 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 oh. Q. 
that's still no. Is, is it wrong? You have two Fs. Oh. You have two Fs. So oh, both. oh, right, right, right. Okay, good. Thanks. Sigma. Uh, sigma. <laughs> uh, then, well, sigma is a permutation. And use uh, alpha. Then uh, alpha permutes the roots of f. Uh, am I good? Uh, alpha preserves. Alpha. Yeah, okay. I'm just going to say alpha preserves all polynomial, uh, all polynomial relations of the roots. So, uh, proof. Uh, suppose, so let uh, R be a root of F. Then sigma of R, uh, okay, then F of uh, R is zero. However, uh, sigma of f of r alpha whoops, is equal to f of sigma uh, alpha rather of r since alpha <coughs> is an automorphism that fixes all coefficients. Same reasoning. <laughs> Rk is equal to alpha of zero is equal to zero. Uh, however, the left hand side is also equal to Exactly the same reason. So this permutation of the roots uh, remain uh, remain uh, satisfying. you know what I meant by this. Uh, so that proves two. So essentially, uh, we have proven that all base field fixing automorphisms are in fact uh, uh, relation preserving permutations. But what about the converse? So are permutations of the roots Uh, also, uh, and also elements of GKF. So in this case, Q. 
So that's, that's the question we want to ask, right? Are these actually uh, corresponding with each other? And the answer is yes, but we'll come back to this question later. Wait, what? Is it? Yes? You're yeah. saying every permutation is, is an auto- Oh, every sorry. Permutation that preserves Are permutations of the roots that, the that preserve all polynomial relations? Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry, okay. yes. Uh, so the, I, I'm considering the inverse question. So are permutations of the roots that preserve, good question, uh, all polynomial relations among the roots? Uh, elements induced by elements of GKF. Because we know that elements of GKF are can be viewed as permutations of the roots by just restricting to a finite subset. Um, but is the converse true? Is, is it always induced by a permutation? So, uh, so it's unclear right, right now. But it turns out to be true. The reason is, uh, if you could preserve all of the roots and their relations, then you can just blindly define the automorphism to simply map any element that, uh, so any element of the splitting field is an expression in terms of the roots, right? So you can just naively just permute everywhere where one root appears, replace it with the, uh, where the permutation would have sent that root. And this naive map turns out to be well-defined, and furthermore, it's an, is an automorphism, simply because you preserved all the possible polynomial relations between them. That's the intuitive way of viewing this. So we will answer this question later. So we'll save this question as question one. <laughs> OK, so uh, in this way, we uh, more or less do the rigorous argument just by using contradiction right? in your method. It, it doesn't your doesn't what you, exp, you doesn't your intuitive argument essentially reduce to a rigorous argument? You just kind of say contradict, assume it's not an automorphism, then something sort of. Well, oh, yeah. oh, yes, you have to say shots well. So anyway, so we'll come back to this later. Uh, so, so now the because of this uh, correspondence between permutations of the classic sense and uh, automorphisms of the field that preserve the coefficients, we. Uh, arrive at modern Galois theory. So the modern Galois theory uh, usually treats this rather than this. That is the difference. And so the question becomes uh, structure of GKF where k is the splitting field of a polynomial in f, coefficients in f, and the relation between the field structure of g uh, containing f. Oh, oops, k containing f. OK, so that is the, this is the modern Galois theory. We replaced this, the original uh, permutations with the group of automorphisms that fix a ground field. So, so after we do this replacement, uh, ironically, this is called the Galois group. You would think that the classical Galois group uh, would be the Galois group. This is the Galois group. But they're the same anyway, right? So it doesn't matter. OK, so, so let us proceed in stating exactly what this relation is. So that is what the rest of the lecture is about. Uh, however, before we do that, I need to get some preliminaries out of the way. So let us do that now. And I have planned a huge list of preliminaries to go through. One million lemmas? This is the <laughs> one million lemmas that I promised not to do. <laughs> but unfortunately, it is necessary. But most of these are pretty basic that you have probably already seen. I'm merely stating these for the record. OK, so the first thing is to uh, define things. Because this is going to be so important, I'm going to call this definition one. And in fact, everything after this will be numbered, believe it or not. So definition one, let f k be fields. Uh, let's do this. 
then uh, a field extension. is the ordered pair. KF. So the field, so the, 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 what, the reason I'm defining this is because it's important to note that the field extension has two things in it, right? It's both the top field and the bottom field. So uh, because this is way too long to write, I'm going to write this, K over F. This is obviously the quotient of k by f, right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so, so I, I, this, is an, this is an important realization that the field extension requires both. So whenever I say a field extension, I mean I'm declaring both to be part of my object. OK, so uh, immediately I will now define, oh, in my notes, somehow this is def definition 3. <laughs> so I will do that in order to not mess up the rest of my notes. Um, we call some, I will sometimes refer to f as the coefficient field, simply because uh, polynomials are going to use the coefficients from the ground field most of the time. Uh, so as we talked about in the last lecture, uh, k is a vector space over f, right? Uh, so it has a dimension, uh, certainly. <laughs> then define, so I guess this is definition four. Then we define this thing to be dim. This vector space. So any vector space has a dimension, and this merely denotes the dimension. Okay? And if this dimension is finite, we'll call this a finite extension. If this is finite, then this extension is said to be finite. And so now let's, so believe it or not, we're now ready to actually prove something. So people refer to this as the tower theorem. And it really is just an exercise in linear algebra and the added benefit of being able to multiply vectors. That is essentially what's happening. So uh, given finite extensions L over K and K over F, uh, the extension, well, I guess I should call this uh, a proposition, and it's going to be phi. Uh, and so the extension L over F, you might expect, is also finite. And furthermore, the exact dimension this vector space over the coefficient field of f, the scalar field, is actually the product of the two uh, dimensions, L over k and k over f. The proof is actually very easy. The intuition why this is true is because any basis of k, proof, L, k, f. So you're going to have some bases, basis elements, x1 to xn, say where this is n. And this is going to also have some basis, y1 up to ym. And how do I get a basis of L over f? Well, I'm only allowed coefficients from f, and I have to span everything in L. So it seems like I'm forced to take all pairwise products. That's OK, so that's the story. So let us tell the story in more words. So uh, proof. So I'm going to use the notation uh, this and that, so my basis 
cases. Basis for k and so consider uh, x i y j where i uh, equals one to m and j equals one to n. No, did I get this wrong? Other way. Okay, so uh, claim this is a basis. So the subproof of this is left as an exercise. <laughs> Do you want me to prove it? No. No, thanks. <laughs> OK, so uh, corollary. This is an important corollary. Because you might, OK, so what are the plausible ways in which you can put an operation here? Well, it could be plus, but it's actually times, right? So that's the, that, that is the main thing to take away. Is, uh, you might think it's plausible for this to be the sum of the two dimensions, but it's not. It's actually the product of the dimensions. Is this a special case of the uh, dimension of a tensor product? Mm, I, I think the character is different. Because the tensor product, uh, re, the field, the coefficient field remains fixed, right? So that. Right. But you could, like, tensor products are used for, like, extension of scalars, right? Sure, you can do that too. Uh, I'm not. So it's not immediately clear how to instantiate this case from that case, yeah. uh, but it might be. So, uh, so yeah, so this is actually a multiplication of dimensions. And as a corollary, uh, this divides this. <laughs> so corollary, L, uh, what's the important one? Kf divides Lf. So when the ground field remains the same, and you get a bigger extension, then the dimensions actually divide. It's not just smaller. So, OK. That does not require any proof, hopefully. Uh, so now we will define, this is actually the corollary 6. So definition 7. So the reason I'm working so much with fields, extensions, is because I want to say that the structure we're interested in of the fields is exactly field extensions. So you have a field extension here, k over f. What about the what about everything in the middle? You have a you have a big field k and a small field f. So maybe the intermediate field structure is the same as the structure of GF, GKF, right? That's 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 the direction we're heading. That's why I'm doing so much about uh, field extensions. So uh, so definition seven. Given k over f and some element in k, we've been talking about this notation for a while, but let's define it now. This is actually this, uh, this the intersection over all fields, uh, intermediate between f and k, such that it also has a. So important thing to take away from this definition is that you require both the top field and the bottom field to define an adjoining element, which is weird. So, I'm, so you might think you just need f to define this. So to sometimes I will explicitly write this, but other times I will not. So beware. <laughs> but yes, you do need to tell me what k is. Otherwise, I don't know what adjoining a means. Well, then what is a, right? Right, exactly. So what is what is a? So you might think, oh, if we had q, then this is just you know a plus b root two. But what's root two? Right, like what? What, what is root two? But it, it's just a symbol now, unless right. you tell me the the full construction that also had root two in it, such as r. I, I, I don't know how to treat this thing. Right? Okay, but it doesn't matter. Like once you've given a field that has root two, if you take any extension of that field, it won't matter. But, but what is having root two? How does a field has? What does it mean for a field? Well, it's in R. So, it. What I mean is like Q sub R root two is the same as Q sub C root two, right? Because R will appear in that intersection. But anyway. what is? Uh, so with 
without the complex numbers, if you want to throw i into r, you better start afresh, right? This is actually, you have to construct it as ordered pairs a, b, where the multiplication is weird. You define a, b plus c, d to be a plus c, b plus d, and you define a, b times c, d to be uh, a, c minus b, d, and a, d plus b, c, right? So this, this is the, this is the extrinsic construction of the complex numbers. And this symbol sort of fades into irrelevance. That, because then at this point you can define the symbol to be this object. Right? So when you enjoy something, be aware that you may not be completely rigorous, is what I'm saying. <laughs> However, when you do have a top field, the, adjoin the adjoining of uh, f with a is always rigorous. OK, so enough time wasted on that discussion. I will now continue. So uh, intuitively, how would you explicitly write down the field f adjoin a? You're basically considering the smallest field that contains a. That's what this intersection says. And we know that the intersection of fields is fields, right? This, is, this, may not be, this may not be clear, but just from field axioms, you can immediately show that the intersection of any chain of fields is a field. Any collection of fields, In which fact, will be a... In fact, any collection of fields is a field. Which will be a chain. As long as uh, it interprets the 0 and 1 in the same way. But yeah, OK, sure. OK, so... Uh, Intuitively, then, you must throw A into F, but then it, it's not a field because it's just a field with the random element there, right? It will like, not be closed under multiplication. So then you close it up. You close it up under multiplication, inverses, negation, and addition, and it will be a field. So formally, composition 8. Uh, F A is actually just the set of all uh, rational functions in A. Proof goes something like this. Let L be the right hand side. Then, uh, because A is in F of A, because when you intersect stuff that all has A, A is in there. Uh, by field axioms, uh, F A must contain all the rational functions of A. In the other direction, if if this is the case, then certainly also by field axioms, this is in K, right? Hence, uh, uh, L is a subset of K. Furthermore. Uh, a is in L. <coughs> Finally, L is a field. This is the, actually the hardest part. I will leave this to you as an exercise because it's really not hard. You just have to verify all the axioms. Hence, L participates in the intersection. Oh, that's also clear. Uh, hence, L participates in the intersection. L is among one of these. Hence, F A is a subset of L. OK, so now we have both directions. And yeah, so F A contains L, and F A is a subset of L. Therefore, they're equal. Good. OK, so this is the concrete way of expressing this. And uh, this sort of concretely expresses exactly why we need a bigger field. Because then we need somewhere to do arithmetic, right? <laughs> OK. So uh, going on, so now this is an important definition. So 
So we'll say, given k f, oh, definition 10, I think. No. 9. 9, given k over f, and some a in k, a is said to be uh, algebraic. There exists a polynomial f in fx such that fa equals zero. Uh, it's called transcendental otherwise. Transcendence. Okay. Non zero f. Non zero f. <laughs> 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 mm -hmm. Good. I remember being punished by that at some point. Uh, so, uh, so now I'm gonna define something called a minimal polynomial. So, uh, being algebraic simply means you satisfy you satisfy a polynomial relation in the in the in the ground field with coefficients coming from the ground field. So uh, you're not too weird. For example, pi is transcendental, but that's not trivial. Uh, it, you, you cannot write down a polynomial and evaluate at pi and hope to get 0 unless you're the 0 polynomial. OK, so definition 10. Uh, you have some polynomial that annihilates you. So you take the smallest degree one, and that's the minimal polynomial. So, uh, given such an algebraic A over F, the minimal polynomial, uh, minimal polynomial, uh, of A over F is uh, some F not zero in, oh god, in some non-zero graph <laughs> in uh, f of x, such that f of x equals f of a equals zero, and no smaller degree non-zero <laughs> polynomial. In fx, vanish at a. The degree of zero is what? The degree of zero is defined usually to be negative infinity. <laughs> <laughs> this is so that the addition of. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and also multiplication works out. The degrees add when you multiply two polynomials. In other words, uh, think of degree as logarithm for polynomials. What? Logarithm. So like, your degree is the number of digits you have. <laughs> and uh, zero has negative infinity digits. <laughs> <laughs> makes perfect sense. Yeah, logarithm makes multiplication additive. <laughs> Except it's far from bijective, right? So, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, okay. So these are sort of lame propositions. But so is it clear that minimal polynomials are irreducible? Yes. Why? Because we're in integral domain. Fields are integral domain. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, the reason is, if your minimal polynomial is not irreducible, it means you can factor it into two non-unit uh, polynomials. OK? That means one of them has got to be 0 when you plug in a, because when you plug in a, it's 0. But then that other thing will have less degree, contradicting the definition of that. OK, so that's the proof. <laughs> proof uh, proposition 12. Monic minimal polynomials are unique. So, 
So uh, why? Take the difference. Yes. Okay. So uh, <laughs> the difference has fewer de uh, smaller degree, and yet it's still zero. Hence, it must be the zero polynomial. Hence, the two polynomials were the same. Okay. So that is the proof. That was fast. <laughs> Thirteen. Uh, oh, this is very important. Given k over f and uh, algebraic a in k, f, so the set of polynomial expressions in a is actually the same as this. Okay, so uh, so this is the this is the first non-trivial result that will be proved in a very trivial manner, and then you'll see why. Okay, can anybody just tell me the intuition behind this? Why Maximal this ideals give uh, fields as their quotient rings. So if you have the the reciprocal of any polynomial, this is just going to be a an element of that quotient ring, so just take its least non-negative residue. There's a fundamental theorem of field there, right? That f adjoint a is equal to f of x quotient out by the minimal yeah. polynomial. Uh, let me give you an, an example. <laughs> so why is uh, this sort of expressible? So I'm thinking of q adjoint root 2. Please express this as a polynomial in root 2. What would you do? Just compute 1 over 1 minus root 2. OK, how? Multiply by conjugates. OK. But what if, hmm, OK, sure. Multiply by <laughs> conjugate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good, yes. So the denominator will have GCD1 with minimal polynomial, so you can find things to multiply them by to get one. That's pretty good. <laughs> okay, so a more general strategy is that the denominator expression will have, will be, so this is like, you can think of it as uh, the polynomial 1 minus x. And Kevin said this polynomial will have GCD1 with the minimal polynomial. Is that true? Minimal Two. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes, I'm like, uh, OK. So yes, they, they will have GCD1. Uh, and because of that, Euclidean algorithm will give you what you want. In, namely, some polynomial s and some polynomial t, such that their sum is 1. When, when these two polynomials add up to 1, now you can plug in root 2 and see that this vanishes. So now you have two polynomials that multiply to 1 uh, at, at a, at a. So, OK? And Therefore, 1 over 1 minus a is simply s evaluated a. So you've converted this rational expression in a to this polynomial in a. So that is the general procedure. So that's right. You do work on one over. You, you do work on how to invert the denominator first. And the way to do that is simply noticing this. So that is the proof. So this direction is trivial. The other direction is let p of a over q of a be in uh, f a. Then since f, the min poly of a, is irreducible and f of a equals 0, it cannot, have, it cannot uh, divide q of x. Right? cannot divide q as polynomials. Because if it did, then q would be 0. That's not, that's not right. Okay. So uh, 
Now, uh, GCD, uh, this is not the reason why it cannot divide Q, but, uh, and it cannot divide Q, comma, the GCD. <laughs> Yeah, so the so so this is the reason for the GCD beam. Okay, is that clear? Because it is reducible and it doesn't divide it, the only way it can share the only way it can share a factor is to divide it because it's irreducible. Okay, so that's why the GCD is one. Therefore, there exists S T such that. ST and ST, such that S, <laughs> SF plus T, oh, yeah, sure, TQ is 1. Therefore, 1 is equal to 1 of A, which is equal to S of A, F of A, plus T of A, Q of A, which is equal to 0. Q of A, is that 0? Uh, therefore, 1 over uh, Q of A equals T of A. So, so P of A over Q of A is equal to P of A times T of A for this magical sort of multiplying by conjugate. So, so yeah, so now we're done. So uh, this GCD thing is going to come back again. So uh, we will see that the fact that this is true is not an accident, in a sense. So uh, just keep in mind this GCD argument. So now comes our last two things before we state our fundamental theorem. So uh, proposition 14, uh, given k over f and a in k, not necessarily algebraic, uh, we have, this is finite if and only if a is algebraic over f. So what does this mean? It means the vector space, when you throw in the A as an algebraic element, uh, becomes a finite dimensional vector space over f. It means there cannot be too many new things you need to throw in, basically. Okay, so, uh, and furthermore, this is an if and only if. So if you didn't require any, too many things to be thrown in, then it will be an algebra, then it had to have been an algebraic element over f. So the proof is actually very stereotypical of this kind of argument over vector spaces. Uh, because vector spaces are multiplication agnostic, you need to do the work, right? Of listing all the powers of A. So, uh, so let's do this direction first. <laughs> okay. So, uh, suppose this vector space dimension is finite. Oh wow! I'm so over time. It's not even funny. Uh, do you guys mind staying? Like I only have no. ten minutes left on the film. Oh shit, okay. Uh, sure, oh, okay, that's fine. So we'll record the next 10 minutes and see how it goes. So suppose this is true. Let uh, So let's call this some number. Uh, let us consider 1. A, A squared, all the way up to A to the N, okay? This is linearly dependent. Because there are N plus one things. I know how to count. 
and plus one vectors. This is linearly dependent since it exceeds the dimension. <laughs> Hence, there exists uh, a, uh, sorry, let's call them, I don't know, lambda <laughs> up to lambda zero up to lambda n uh, in f, not all zero, such that You have another card. <laughs> yes. Okay. Good. Lambda zero plus lambda one of x plus lambda n x to the n. So that is my polynomial, right? Okay. So th this is actually a very typical argument. So so like you will see this again and again. In fact, very soon in the next corollary. So that's why I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to say use the same argument. Uh, in any case, the reverse case is harder. Uh, suppose A is algebraic. Can you explain to me why this has to be finite? Reduce all the powers by using the minimal polynomial. That's right. So let F be the one min poly of A over F. Okay, and uh, then we uh, so let M equal the degree of F. Okay, so in fact, why don't we write out what F is? So consider the set, well, the list, because it's an ordered basis. Uh, a, 1, A, A squared, A to the M minus 1. <laughs> OK, and uh, I, c I claim that this is a basis. This is a basis. Well, clearly, by lemma, by lemma, this is why I numbered it. So good. <laughs> Thirteen. <laughs> Nobody uh, remembers that. <laughs> F A is equal to F A. powers of A can be reduced to the lower power using okay uh, F of A zero. That's the argument <laughs> in this direction. Is this clear? Yes, yes. So as an example, suppose, uh, suppose so let p in fx, uh, p of a is equal to mu 0 plus, plus mu k x to the k, a to the k. Um, uh, use long division. So here's an example. Use long division uh, 
to find, to express Q, well, P. Why don't I just use this here? Uh, to express P as uh, some quotient times F plus a remainder. Degree of R is less than the divisor, which is N. Now P of A is equal to Q of A, F of A, plus R of A, which is equal to R of A. Okay? So instead of trying to express this as a linear combination of the spanning set, you can instead express that in terms of the linear combination of the spanning set. And the advantage of that is the degree of this is less than M, as, as claimed here. And so you only involve powers that are less than M. So that's why this is sufficient for a spanning set. So I guess this is not much of an example if it's completely general. <laughs> OK, so to prove that it's linearly independent, we merely have to use the fact that this is minimal. So suppose there's a non-trivial relation among uh, the uh, basis elements. Well, I can prove that it's a basis, but I don't know. So suppose there exists uh, lambda 1, uh, no, mu 1, mu 0, rather, to mu m minus 1, not all 0, such that uh, mu 0 plus mu 1 a plus plus mu m minus 1, a m minus 1, equals 0. This contradicts the minimality of that. OK, so it's, therefore, this is linearly independent. This is an important theorem. It allows us to establish this corollary. Every element of FA is algebraic. Well, not really a corollary. Some people use corollary to say, by using the same proof technique, you can prove the, the similar result. And that is, in fact, the original meaning of the word corollary, until people began to say, well, that's not really that rigorous. So we'll, uh, we'll call something a corollary if you can use the previous theorem as a black box and not put it inside <laughs> of the details. So I'm going to use this in the white box sense and say that every element of FA is algebraic over F, provided A is algebraic. So uh, uh, it was brought to my attention that we didn't even need to uh, show that uh, the, this is linearly independent because we didn't claim anything about the actual size of the basis. But the thing is, we could have stated in the theorem a more precise result, which I'm going to write down uh, over here. So uh, we said FA over F is less than infinity. Uh, if and only if A is algebraic over F. I should have said, moreover, uh, this degree is exactly equal to the degree of the min polynomial A over F. So yeah, so that's, that's why I went on and showed that it was literally independent because you have this nice equality. OK, so uh, back to the corollary. Every, so we, we said every element of FA is algebraic over F, provided A is algebraic over F. That just means if A has a polynomial relation in itself, every other polynomial in A also has a polynomial relation in themselves. That's what it's saying. 
You don't get uh, transcendental elements just by applying a polynomial to A. That's what it's saying. So the, 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 the way to prove that is, of course, taking an arbitrary element, proof of the corollary, taking an arbitrary element in F of A, uh, you can express it in terms of a polynomial in A because of our lemma 13. Uh, but now, you can do the same trick. Look at this. Well, I guess I didn't need to express it as a polynomial in A. Uh, K, and continue on forever. Okay. So this list must uh, this list must stop before it becomes linearly dependent at some finite point, because the dimension of the vector space is finite. Yes. Uh, linearly independent. Dependent. Because, so I should put brackets around this. Uh, so why do I not write FA? That's just a tower theorem, right? It's linearly dependent uh, because. This is finite. Because it's a finite dimensional vector space, you cannot have an infinite list of linearly independent things. And the finite list is precisely the polynomial relation you're looking for. So I'm not going to write down that, because it should be clear. OK, so we have now proceeded through enough preliminaries to, uh, for us to finally discuss uh, the punchline. So we talked about automorphism groups. So, and, and its potential link to the intermediate fields. So let us draw some pictures. You have a field K that is the splitting field of some, poly, uh, of some polynomial in some ground field F. Now, look at the automorphism group of K that picks F. Okay, and so I'm going to go down to like the subgroup containing just the identity. And I, I asked you the question, in what sense can we biject these two things? Intermediate fields over here, and intermediate groups over here. So what can we expect the relation to be? Well. Uh, one way to biject them is to say, well, how about just do, the, just do this again, right? So maybe you have an intermediate field M, and you would like to look at the things that fix M. Okay? And this will somehow correspond to that, where this is the set of all things that fix K, and there's only one of them. And somehow, we would like that to happen, where uh, the set of all, where f, uh, so well, this is true by definition, but OK, what about the inverse, of, inverse uh, identification? How do we go from here to there? Six. Suppose you have some subgroup h, just, just some subgroup h. How do you go to a field over here? Well, that's just asking. Uh, let's look at so let's look at the field fixed by H. So that is the definition I'm going to make. Given H subset of uh, ought K. So I'm going to be more general. Uh, denote uh, K H. To be the subfield, well, well, I'll show you why it's a field in a minute. To be the set of all things in K, such that for all automorphisms in H, it fixes them. And this is clearly a field. 
because if because these are automorphisms, automorphisms. So if you two if two things are in K H, then let's look at their sum. Well, given any sigma in H, sigma of this is equal to sigma of this plus sigma of this, but x and y are in KH, so they get fixed. So look, sigma fixes x plus y. So the sum, if two things are fixed, then their sum is fixed. And for the same reason, the product is fixed, the inverse is fixed, and the negation is fixed. And 0 is fixed, and 1 is fixed. Therefore, uh, this is a field. So we call this the field fixed by H, or the fixed field of H. Okay, So this is called the fixed field of H. And we hope that this is an inverse operation, right? So to what extent are these inverse operations? That is our uh, big question, too. To what extent are and Inverse operations. Should have read it the other way. <laughs> and this will be our big question, too. Okay? So, um, well, let's provide some intuition. Let's go back to our favorite field. Except this time, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to throw in all three roots. I'm instead going to just throw in this one root and look at what happens. Okay. So, well, if this is my k and that's my f, then what is uh, so we, we we discussed. Okay. So what is uh, uh, so let's see. In ought Q this, um, let's look at the set of all. So, so first of all, let's let's look at GKF. What is this? Trivial. Why is it trivial? Because it must permute the roots, the roots of this, but there is no other root to permute to, yeah. so it has to send it to itself. The rest of the field is determined, so it has this, so it's the identity, just the identity. Okay, and we would like, so when we plug in f into m, we would like f, we would like k to the gkf to be f. If these are inverse operations, then this should be true. However, as you can see, GKF is trivial, so it fixes everything. So, whoops. <laughs> this is too big. Why is this the case? It's not normal. Thanks. Um, let's provide some intuition. Why did this fail? We would like this to have a rich structure. So that in order to be fixed, you better be fixed by more things, right? So then you're probably going to shave down to f. The more the more symmetries you have in this exponent, the harder it is to be fixed by all of them, right? Uh, and then you're going to be more likely to be f because every one of these things are required to fix f. So if there's a lot of these, you would expect this to be f. Right? But because you're so restricted, you don't have many things that can, that, that can go into this exponent. What would have made this more free is if we, if we had the other two roots. right? So if we had the other two roots, what would this GKF be? It would be all of S3, because their symmetries are so rich. Now is it equal? Yes. 
you can't be fixed by all permutations unless you are the ground field. You're a coefficient, right? There's one minute left. Yeah. Okay, so that's okay. Uh, I will s I will comment on the rest of this talk in a comment. <laughs> so now it's true. So it appears that we get this inverse relations uh, if every element of this field also has the other elements that should be in the field, namely the other roots of, this, of the polynomial it solves. Does this make sense? So if we have this element, I also expect its conjugate elements to be in there. Because then I can have a rich thing to put here so that it's harder to be fixed and then I can get back to where it was. Right, that's the, that's the intuition. So when I say conjugate, I mean take anything in the field. By our corollary, everything in the field is uh, algebraic, so it has a satisfying polynomial. Take that polynomial, it will have other roots, right? Take its minimal polynomial, it will have other roots. And I also want the other roots to be in the field. So that is the property I'm looking for. Well, at least this hints that this is the property we must be looking for. And what is that property called? No. It's a splitting field, right? So that is so. So questions we have to answer are: Sure, splitting fields contain every root of the element being a joint. But what about the other elements? What about their polynomials? Are their other roots also in the field? So if this is true, then we are sort of getting closer to the inverse operation. Okay. So that is the partial answer to the big question.